This is the Hiking Through Life podcast. We've all been gifted a journey called life. Let's see where the journey leads us today. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast, where we talk with people who in some way, shape, or form have been influenced by the outdoors. I'm Andy, the producer of this podcast, and my lovely wife, Sarah, will be your host. Together, we make up Hiking Through Life. This podcast is all about bringing all kinds of people who are inspired by the outdoors and sharing their stories. We hope that by sharing people's stories, it inspires others to get out and live a more meaningful life. Tune in every week for new episodes, or better yet, subscribe to the Hiking Through Life podcast on your favorite podcast provider. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. Also, if you have a story to share or know of anyone who might be interested in being a guest on this podcast, head on over to hikingthroughlife.net slash podcast and get in touch with us. Now sit back and enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast. We are joined on the podcast today by Linda Eckeson McGurk. She is an author, journalist, outdoor advocate, and mother of two who lives in Sweden. She wrote the book, There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather, and has a blog, Rain or Shine Mama. Linda is passionate about promoting the benefits of outdoor experiences for families and children. We are so happy to have you on the podcast today, Linda. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So let's start off just by having you tell us about your background and growing up in Sweden. What was it like? What memories do you have as a child? So yeah, I was born and raised in Sweden and uh, nature has sort of always been a part of my life as it tends to be when you grow up in this part of the world. Nature is really seen as a, an essential part of a good childhood here. So it's very much part of society, not just sort of on the family level, but also like at school and uh, it's just supported on sort of all levels. We have, um, we have the freedom to roam, which means we can access nature, even like privately owned uh, property. Uh, we can go into the woods pretty much anywhere. And I didn't realize how unique this is until I moved away from here. And um, we kind of see nature as a, you know, access to nature as a birthright. Uh, so it's quite unique. I think Scandinavians in general are just sort of known to be nature lover, lovers. And it, it starts already in, in, you know, in infancy. And, and uh, you know, we just tend to get outside a lot. And I grew up close to some woods and I spent a lot of time playing there and um, outside at recess at school, you know, playing outside was just a part of our lives. Um, and we, you know, we, we don't have the best climate here for outdoor play. We, um, it's, it's pretty rainy and cold, um, but it didn't really matter because I think that just made people more determined to get outside because you can't really sit around and wait for it to get sunny and warm because, because <laughs> then you might just get stuck inside, you know, not getting out at all. Basically, you know, the, all the adults in, in my life just told me to, you know, get outside, whether it is raining or snowing or, uh, windy or whatever, um, uh, we just dress for the weather and, and go outside. And hence the, the name of my book, There's No Such Thing as, <laughs> as Bad Weather. Uh, it's actually an old Scandinavian saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothes. So that's what the adults would tell us and then just sort of kick us out the door. <laughs> yeah, and like there's a handful of times where you talk about that in your book where you're, you and your daughters are kind of walking down the streets and strangers see you guys in pouring rain and they're like, do you want to come under our roof? Do you want to come inside to stay dry, let the rain, rain let up? And you just reply, no, it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I just sort of have that attitude towards the weather that we go outside every, every day, regardless of the weather. But once I moved to Indiana, I realized it was, uh, it was very different there. So yes, uh, I became a curiosity pretty quickly. 
when I was outside, not only in the rain, but also like in the winter where people would see me at the playground, we'd be the only ones there. And, you know, I didn't understand why it's like, Winter is an awesome time to be in the play, you know, at the playground, you know, it's fun. There's maybe snow and it's just, you know, it's fun for the kids and why not? But I had people come up to me and say, you know, you must really like winter. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you crazy person, what are you doing out here? So I, I could never quite shake that feeling of being just a tad crazy for being out there. And it, it was just so strange to me because what I was doing was nothing odd. Like it wouldn't, like over here in Sweden, nobody would have uh, given me a second look. But in Indiana, it was, it was really quite different. Yeah, absolutely. And like here in the States, there's like some states that are like way more outdoorsy than others. Like I live in Minnesota and Minnesota is a pretty outdoorsy state. So for mm -hmm. somebody to be out in the middle of winter doing crazy winter activities isn't so unheard of, but yeah, there are some you're all states. descendants of Scandinavians, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. So we just have that winter love and winter blood in us. Yes. And, you know, and I experienced that difference too, because I lived in Montana for a couple of years before moving to Indiana. And I actually felt like there was less of a difference for me moving from Sweden to Montana than it was moving from Montana to Indiana. It's funny, but I, I really felt like the difference between the two states was just vast, um, with Montana being much more outdoorsy. And I think there's a self-selection going on there. If you like the outdoors, you tend to move to a state where there's a lot of, you know, national forests and um, just a lot of like-minded people, you know, skiing in the winter, uh, camping and hiking in the summer and so forth. So, you know, in Montana, I really, you know, I felt like home, <laughs> but then I, I moved to Indiana and I had two kids and it changed my whole perspective. And I realized that it was very different, not just in Indiana, but a lot of places in the U.S. where kids just did not get outside as much. And that's kind of when I got thinking about writing a book after I had my first daughter, because I thought the, the cultural differences were, were so peculiar, and I thought it would be worth writing a book about it. And so you wound up in Indiana because of your husband, right? Did he have family there? Yes, he um, he is from Indiana, so he had his family there and the family business, and we just thought it would be a good good place to to raise a family, uh, which it was in a lot of uh, ways. It was just that aspect was very different for me. The whole sort of lack of uh, nature connection, and it was something that I pretty quickly came to miss a lot. Yeah, I mean, if you grow up with that, and then when you, you're you gone from it, it's like you, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Exactly. So what were some of the, like, thoughts and reactions you had when you first sent your daughters to school in Indiana? Well, actually, it started earlier. Like, I noticed already when they were really little, and I went back to work and I started looking for a babysitter so that I could, you know, start working part-time at least from home a few days a week. And um, I started looking around and I was kind of surprised to see that the babysitters, they didn't seem to really uh, plan for outdoor play. So I, you know, looked at some places and, and, and I asked to see the backyard because these were sort of mostly other moms having, you know, at home daycares. And I remember, you know, asking to see, you know, where the kids played and, and they would just kind of look at me like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, you know, I'd see the backyard and, and then I realized, you know, the girl that I ended up going with, once my daughter started going there, I realized they, the kids were just never outside in the backyard. So that's why she didn't really know why I wanted to see the backyard because the kids were just not really there. And especially not in the winter time. This wasn't entirely the babysitter's fault because the parents would just 
bring the kids there in the winter with just like little you know, summer shoes and just like a thin jacket and not not dress for outdoor play at all because there was just no expectation of it. That was just really strange to me because I just assumed that the kids would be outside playing every day, but yeah. that was not the case at all. In early childhood, I do feel like there's more of an emphasis on getting outdoors Mm -hmm. um in the USA there's more of an emphasis for young children to get outdoors than like elementary children per se so right. but yeah there's there's plenty of areas where it's just not yeah the norm yeah I think it varies a lot um and then you know then they started preschool which was also really different because the academic expectations were a lot higher in the states than they are here in Sweden before the age of seven uh, or six, when, when kids start school here, um, I think parents and preschool teachers, there's this consensus that, um, you know, they want to really want to give the kids the time and space to just play and just be kids. So that's kind of, it's like a sacred thing here. Parents just don't have the same expectations on little kids as as they do in the States and not just the parents, but because the whole, I mean, the, the whole education system has changed so much lately. And I know teachers struggle with this. Um, they're talking about kindergarten being the new first grade and, and so forth. And that means, well, preschool then becomes the new kindergarten. And it's all about, you know, constantly preparing the kids for the next step instead of maybe letting them be in the here and now and where they are now in their development, I found it hard to accept. Like, I, I just didn't really agree with that. And having said that, I mean, my kids went to a, a, like a, what they call play-based preschool, but it was very prescribed still. Like the, all the activities were very prescribed and not, not so free. The teacher seemed to worry that uh, well, partly that the kids were going to fall behind, but also that the parents weren't going to think that the kids were doing enough, you know, like work or um, that they were just letting them play, uh, which, you know, they, the parents might think they might, might as well do that at home. So why pay for preschool if they're just <laughs> going to play anyway, you know? <laughs> so, so that, so out came the worksheets and the, letter tracing activities and the Pinterest crafts and, and all this. So it was, you know, it was still a nice preschool. I'm not knocking them at all, but it's just the whole culture of pushing these academics so hard, um, like on the little kids as well. Right. Absolutely. And uh, like you said, it's developmentally, like what is developmentally appropriate practice? It's to not be pushing them exactly but yeah absolutely like and in your book I think you said by the time you guys got back to the USA after your six months in Sweden your daughter had wanted to start writing letters mm -hmm. but right. there's the difference right there like she showed you she was ready for it right but here in the USA like you're saying we do push and push and push yes and I mean kids are all so different some kids are ready to do that kind of stuff early and want to, and that's fine, but we shouldn't all be trying to, to push them to the same level because they're just, they're just at different, you know, different places in their journeys. So then was it like around the preschool age for your daughters that you decided you were going to go try out Sweden? Um, yeah, they were, my oldest daughter was eight and my youngest daughter was five when we got here. And I, I guess it was a combination of things. My dad had fallen ill with cancer and I felt like I wanted to be a little closer to him while he was going through, you know, a, a rehabilitation and so forth. And uh, also, yeah, I, I wanted to go back to Sweden to see if it was still the way I remembered it, because I think we all get like, we can get caught up in these sort of sentimental memories sometimes about our childhoods and you know a lot ha has changed over here in Sweden as well since I was a kid obviously so I wanted to see if the nature connection was still as strong and if outdoor play was still as big of a deal 
over there as it had been when I was a child. And I desperately wanted for my kids to try that um, because I felt like it had been so beneficial to me. I was so frustrated with them not getting the opportunity to experience that in the U.S. It wasn't just the academics, um, but it was also the fact that outdoor play in inclement weather was just constantly seen as something unnatural, maybe even dangerous. You know, I didn't want them to grow up thinking that um, and thinking that I was the strange one because I was, you know, the only one sort of pushing them to go outside and play even when it was raining or snowing. So I wanted them to see that this is actually normal in some parts of the world. So it was like a combination of things that made me wanna go back. And then I also had the idea for the book and I thought, you know, what better way to, um, to try it out than, than to actually move back here for six months and, and see how it goes and see what the kids think of it. And, so off we went. Yeah. And I mean, I think it was in your book, you also said the school list that the preschool gave you in Sweden was like, bring extra clothes. You need to have wool socks. You need to have boots. You need to have all of the proper outdoor gear because this is what we do. And luckily I work at a preschool where going outside is a priority every day. Weather depending, of course, they do yeah. say that. We don't go out in a storm. I don't know if they do. Do they go out in like storms in Sweden? Uh, not storms, like not real bad storms, but we don't get those real often. And also if, if there's extreme cold, um, they may not take the, the very youngest kids out. But by extreme cold, I'm, I'm talking like negative 25 Celsius. So that's, um, oh, I can't do the conversion <laughs> quickly in my head, <laughs> but it's cold. <laughs> it's very cold. Yeah. And I mean, obviously if there's thunder, lightning, uh, any sort of hazardous conditions, uh, no, but regular cold, wind, uh, rain, yeah, rain, snow. Yeah. They're outside. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so thankful that that's the type of preschool and philosophy that I work for right now, which Mm. I can't imagine being in a preschool where they just drill kids at a desk all the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, but yeah, just the differences of lists that like a USA preschool would give versus what you get in Sweden. Like, I don't even think there was markers or crayons on that list you mentioned. <laughs> the schools, all the preschools and schools, they always, they have all the supplies. You don't have to shop for supplies here. It's all provided uh, to the kids. So they just want you to come, um, the kids to come like well-dressed and plenty of changes of clothes. Cause they will, you know, you, you know, they're going to get wet. They're going to get dirty. They do have like big sort of industrial sized dryers at the school <laughs> where the kids can hang in their clothes to dry between recess periods. Um, and they do use those a lot. I mean, they're like running <laughs> constantly in the winter and the spring and the fall when it's like raining all the time. You know, they, yeah, they want you to bring rain boots and, you know, uh, like insulated boots. So different types of clothes to um, enable play in different types of weather. So this is, you know, this is on the parents, but the schools make it very clear at the start of the school year, this is what we expect. And, and it's not, and it's the same everywhere. So it's not just some preschools, like all parents know this is how it is. So it's not, it's not a big deal. It's, it's something that you're used to and you just get the clothes for the kids and, and send them, send them in with them you know, when they go to preschool. So it's not, not a big thing. And that goes for Every, like every grade, correct? Like as they get up into the elementary and later grades too, that going yes. outdoors for recess. Yeah, definitely up until, you know, there's a, there's a turning point when the kids, uh, I'd say th around fifth grade, where the kids are starting to become self-conscious about what they're wearing and they, yeah, they're just going to go outside without wearing hats and gloves. And no matter what you tell them. Sounds like the USA as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So I think there's a phase there for some time until they, I don't know, until maybe until they finish high school. I don't know. I don't remember when I started wear when I started realizing again that, you know, it's pretty nice to actually wear clothes that keep you warm and not just like make you look good. <laughs> but yeah, they can figure out if they get cold, um, they'll put more clothes on. Right, right. Train them when they're young. Let them make their own decisions. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So what were some of the like most impactful events that happened during your time in Sweden that really made you want to raise your daughters in that lifestyle more? Um, you know, I think a lot of it was just seeing how I, our life sort of slowed down especially for the kids, you know, they had less homework. Um, there was just more emphasis on outdoor play, play in general, but outdoor play um, specifically like after school. And I loved having just this community of outdoor play. I felt like for the first time in their lives, I wasn't the only one trying to tell them that, hey, you need to go outside, you know, <laughs> go outside and play, it's good for you, we need to get out and get fresh air. I was feeling like this broken record all the time, <laughs> just like driving me crazy. Um, once we got here to Sweden, uh, it was so nice that, you know, the teachers were telling them the same thing, like the grandparents, like their friends' parents, um, so every, everybody was just on the same page about outdoor play. So they were getting it from so many different directions. Um, and all of this sort of helped normalize it, I think. So I really liked it. Um, we, yeah, we just, we lived in an, like a really old, old little homestead. And it was a very simple lifestyle, but it was, it was liberating. I, we had we didn't have more clothes than what we had packed in our suitcases coming over here. And we, <laughs> we wore those for, you know, the duration, uh, six months and, uh, it was refreshing. It definitely made me more harmonious. And I think with me being, you know, feeling happier and more relaxed, I think that also spilled over on the kids. So it was definitely a good experience with just less pressure overall on them to achieve and just less pressure to yeah achieve in, in general. Everything just kind of slowed down and, and they were able also to, I think, direct their own learning uh, a lot more. Uh, schools tend to be a little more, uh, there's like a flatter structure, so there's not as much top-down instruction. There's more sort of discovery by the kids and more, more, a lot more self-directed learning, even in the, even in elementary school, not just the preschools. And I, I really like that. And I, I think it's good, good for the kids. Yeah. And the direct learning goes back to like, what's developmentally appropriate? What are they ready for at no, not even their age, just developmentally? What are they ready for? What do they what do they want to know more about? They they will show you what they want. Yes, definitely. And also another thing that I noticed uh, was a lot different was how they had uh, more freedom in, in Sweden. I mean, I had always given my kids a lot, a lot of freedom to play outside, you know, by themselves as soon as they were old enough or, or mature enough to, to do that, in my opinion. I felt like American society uh, overall is pretty restrictive. And in some states, um, as you know, you can really get in trouble as a parent if you give your kids too much freedom. Um, people calling the police if they see your kids walking, you know, walking around by themselves. And so I always sort of had that fear sort of in the back of my head being um, more of a you know, what, what they sometimes call free range parent by giving my kids that type of freedom in the U S I always kind of, yeah, I was always worried that, that somebody was going to call the cops on me or something. You never know, but cause there are cases, they, there have been cases like that. Yeah. There was a case in, in your book where you mentioned that a case in Maryland, I think. And yeah, it's just so 
ingrained in our minds that when we see a child alone, they're not safe. We need to check on that. And I mean, I for sure have that in my mind that I need to make sure they're okay. Where's their parent? That's just where my mind goes, raised in this society. Yeah, it's very um, risk averse. And um, also, yeah, so, so, so what I noticed here in Sweden, uh, was that the kids were just getting around a lot more on their own and it was perceived as perfectly normal. Um, so I think the kids grew a lot in that. Um, especially my oldest daughter was able to get around a lot on her own with her or with her friends. And yeah, it just, it makes them grow and, and take responsibility. And, and uh, you know, the parents were not stressed out about it. And there's this sort of social trust, which I also talk about in the book, um, that neighbors kind of help each other out and look look out for the kids, you know, if somebody's always sort of uh, keeping an eye out or the kids kind of run from one house to another or they ride their bikes around the block and it's, it's not a big deal. And I really enjoyed that part of the culture because that's what I remember from my childhood and I know a lot of Americans remember that too um, especially people over 40 or so I mean I, I hear a lot of those stories from Americans who feel like it has become a lot more more restrictive the kids are just less free than they used to be um, and I think that's part of the you know the the fear factor of the the past few decades. Absolutely. I mean, I'm only in my 30s and I remember growing up wandering my neighborhood with a friend just for hours and hours when I was young and just going like two or three miles away. And I think a lot of parents would have fear of that right now. And it, and because of these cases with um, parents who, who uh, get in trouble and, and it's it's become seen as abnormal for kids to be by yourself. Like I said, we were the culture has come to a point where we're expecting kids to be constantly supervised. And this, historically speaking, has just not happened before, I don't think. I think this is a new, completely new phenomenon. Like I, I can see that people have this fear, but we also have to recognize that it's not uh, it's not rational. And I think as a society, we need to take a hard look at it. Yeah, I, I just don't think it's I don't think it's good for the kids, and I don't think it's good for the parents either <laughs> to be that stressed out. But having said that, I, I realize that there are a lot of factors that could impact a child's freedoms like you know not being not growing up in a safe area for example like I constantly have to check my privileges like you know having grown up in a safe area and raising my kids in a very safe area there are certainly places where it's not safe for kids to play outside by themselves Um, so I definitely recognize that and traffic is another factor in some places where it's just not safe. But where it is safe, you know, I I find that a lot of times the the most, the kids that are the most restricted are the ones that live in like really safe neighborhoods. Um, Yes. (laughs) That's funny how that works. Um, I I had one uh, researcher tell me once that it sort of becomes this uh, self-reinforcement. Like we, we, our society is so safe and uh, now that we we are doing everything we can to sort of keep it keep it safe keep it that way um so it's just one of those things right and what are you doing for a child when you're constantly watching them constantly kind of helicoptering them in a way um i mean it's like the tagline of your book raising healthy, resilient, and confident children, giving them those opportunities to go out on their own is boosting their confidence like no other. Yes, absolutely. You know, that's one of the things that I definitely see in my kids. I think resilience, um, if there's one thing that they really learned from their uh, many, many hours outside uh, in their lifetime so far, it is that they are they're pretty hardy. And I think this is, it's really important. Um, And I know there are studies showing that resilience is more, 
is a, is a stronger predictor of future success than uh, IQ or grades or you know, anything or fluency with numbers, anything like that. Resilience is, that's it. That's, that's what you want. You know, to just to explain the term a little bit, it's, it's you know, the, basically the ability to, you know, set long-term goals and, and uh, reach those goals despite hardship along the way, or, you know, you, you face these challenges and, and you um, bounce back after difficulties. So definitely a quality that you want to see in kids. Yeah. And by letting them go outdoors and explore, there's so many opportunities where they're going to fall and they're going to scrape and they're going to cry, but they'll bounce back and learn from it. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of terms, can we touch on some of the Scandinavian terms that you used in your book? Yes, like absolutely. Fruit, I don't even, I'll, I'll butcher <laughs> it if I fruit to Free, free lift leave, free lift leave, <laughs> free the sleeve, free the sleeve. There you go, free the sleeve. Yep, you got it. Now it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's um, it basically translates to uh, fresh air life or open air life. Um, and that kind of says it all, I think. Um, it's this lifestyle that sort of revolves around uh, being outside in nature. And uh, it's something, I mean, the term was first used in the 1850s. It's basically, it's not so much an activity or outdoor recreation. It can be outdoor recreation, but not necessarily. And, and to, because sometimes those terms are used synonymously, but that, it's not quite right. Friluftsleben specifically refers to like a, a sort of, like a deeper nature connection. It's like communing with nature with very simple means. Um, and you don't have to have like a specific agenda when you go outside. It's all about uh, being in nature, that is the, uh, that is just the, the means and the, the goal, it's just to be in nature. Whereas outdoor recreation can be a lot of things that could be, you know, like anything, any activity that you do outside can be outdoor recreation, like water skiing, you know, snowmobiling, uh, playing soccer, um, anything like that. But free is more like, uh, I like to, Think of it as slow nature you know we got slow food but this is like slow nature <laughs> it's basically in its simplest form just going for a walk taking your dog out um, explore nature in your neighborhood um, it can be hiking it could be yeah backpacking um, you can use gear but you don't have to uh, it, it can be very very simple so that's sort of the essence of it I love that. I love it so much because it's just, it's simple too. And like how you're saying you don't need gear. Cause I think a lot of the time people think to go outdoors, to have fun in the outdoors, you need gear. You need the fanciest things from REI. You need the nicest shoes, the nicest packs, but no, that's, that's not what it's about. It's right. about getting outside and giving yourself those benefits of it. And you talked about this in your book too, just how like your earliest days were with your grandparents and your grandparents didn't have fancy gear either. They just brought you outside every day. Yeah, yeah, I know. I like to use my grandparents as an example because they they just sort of, uh, they, they seem to personify the whole free to sleeve spirit. Like they were not, not hardcore outdoor enthusiasts at all. They were very average Swedes in terms of how they communed with nature, um, the, their relationship with nature. It was very sort of everyday, uh, on an everyday basis. So, you know, they would just go for walks every day. Um, like in the spring, we would go for little walks just to look at all the wildflowers blooming. You know, they would take me to tons of local preserves. We didn't, we didn't drive far, like places within an hour's drive or so, um, or we just walk around the neighborhood. They did take me to Lapland when I was three years old. And that is one of the journeys that has made the, the biggest impact on me. It was my grandparents and my parents, uh, and my sister, and they just, they just loved Lapland. It's a very scenic uh, area of Sweden, uh, way up north, north of the, uh, the Arctic Circle. You know, we just sort of hiked through these scenic mountains and 
I've ended up taking both of my daughters up there. My oldest daughter was when I was back here in Sweden for those six months, we, we went up there uh, because I, I felt so strongly about that place because to me, it represented not just uh, the nature, but also the connection that I have with my grandparents. And I wanted my daughters to experience it as well. So certainly those types of epic journeys could have a place in connecting children with nature. I still think that the everyday experiences are maybe even more important because they happen like regularly and those shape a, a child even more than than just a few bit of those bigger trips so and then my grandparents when we were up there they were hiking in their jeans and just like their <laughs> rain boots um definitely no fancy gear there in rain boots oh my <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was the hiking outfit of the day. I've seen the pictures because it's very wet up there. You get a lot of melt water from the mountains. So you have to, in some parts, you have to cross over some pretty big uh, creeks. So the rain boots uh, help then, but still, it just looks really clunky and uncomfortable. I don't know how they did it, but that's, that's what they wore back then. Yeah, and and they and my grandparents weren't even like I said they weren't sport athletic they were not fit at all um, but they still enjoyed having those sort of everyday encounters with nature right and they they shared that with you and it's benefited you so much and your whole country has to be is it just like an overall feel of kind of like happiness and calmness over there that's what I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> no? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, our quality of life is high. So, and, and we do, we do typically rate pretty high on this, uh, on these inter international happiness indexes. <laughs> yeah. I know the Danes, uh, they always try to claim that, that top spot, you know, the Danish people, uh, but I know the Dutch try to claim it too. So I don't know, <laughs> the jury is still out. <laughs> who is, wh who, who's the happiest in Europe? Um, I, I don't know. I think, yeah, I think we're pretty, I think we're pretty happy probably c compared to a lot of places in, in the world. And I think the nat our nature connection helps with that because I mean it's proven nature has a positive uh, impact on anxiety and uh, just mental health in general and it can also benefit you in, in other ways like physically uh, with uh, high blood pressure and it can help counteract you know obesity and diabetes all those sort of uh, lifestyle diseases that were that we've gotten so used to so it's, it's really beneficial and the, the government recognizes it too and that's why they're pushing it because they understand it's a it's great preventive health care that's why there's a lot of support and support for parks you know like national parks and and uh and things like that as well it's like so huge it's such simple simple health care to be getting outside but a lot of other countries don't see it that way quite yet, unfortunately. Yeah, it's it's starting to become more common. Uh, in Japan, they've used it since the 80s, the forest bathing. They actually use it as treatment. I think we're starting to see it in North America as well, where, where some doctors are actually prescribing outdoor time for some conditions. So I think we're getting there. It's a little slow moving in some parts of the world, but... Um, it's great to see it, you know, nature being recognized though. People are starting to wake up to it and that's a great thing. It is. And maybe that means more people are going to start um, socially accepting letting their babies nap outdoors in strollers like you guys do <laughs> over there. That was kind of surprising to me when I read that, that you just let babies nap outside while you guys are grabbing your coffee and pastry in the coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty common here to you know because you don't want you don't want to bring the the baby inside because then the baby is gonna wake up. You've been out for a nice walk and the baby is napping soundly and in the stroller and uh, probably just, so much quieter outside too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the fresh air they nap so well outside. 
they've even studied that and they, they take deeper and longer naps outside and, and uh, they're more alert and have better appetite when they wake up afterwards. So doctors even recommend it here. It's a very common practice. So not, not everybody would probably be comfortable leaving the kids, you know, outside. If you go into like a coffee shop, most people, if they, as long as they can see the stroller, they're fine with it, I think. Yeah. But at home, definitely a vast majority of people do it, let's say here. Yeah. That was just so funny to me. Cause like when I read that, I just kind of chuckled. Cause I was like, the only thing that somebody would leave outside here in the USA is their dog yeah. outside of a coffee <laughs> shop. Like you would rarely ever see a baby in a stroller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you did, you'd probably call the cops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you even mentioned that in your book that somebody yeah. did. It was a Danish Danish tourist who <laughs> did that in New York City, which was not not a good move at all. <laughs> so she she got in, into trouble, and, and I probably wouldn't have done it if I'd been in in New York either. But you know, over here where I feel where I know the the neighborhoods and so forth, yeah, I would do it definitely. Yeah, a little different when you know your surroundings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And then um, the whole view on germs, too, I would love for you to touch on and how here people are so overly concerned with germs and we're constantly yeah. giving kids Lysol wipes. Yes, and the, obviously this is a timely question with um, the whole corona pandemic going on. And, uh, and this is why germs get a bad rep, because obviously when you get viruses like like the corona um, virus uh, it can be it can be really bad but you got to remember that there there are different types of germs you have pathogenic germs which obviously like the coronavirus but you also have a lot of harmless harmless bugs and some that are even beneficial and the vast majority of the germs that are found outside like in the soil um, in our surroundings, um, they're either harmless or, ben or even beneficial. I mean, there are uh, germs in the soil that can even, you know, make us happy. This, they work as a, a natural antidepressant. And uh, I think we just got to remember, we got to keep them separated. Like we, <laughs> we need to remember that not all germs are bad and we, we actually need germs because if we're overly clean, then our immune systems don't get enough training and they will start reacting against things that aren't actually harmful to us. Like, you know, that's where at least what researchers think um, is the reason for food allergies and, and things like that is what they're, they call the hygiene hypothesis. Like the societies are so clean now that our immune systems just don't have anything to do. Right. And then you see kids that are like constantly sick, but you wonder, is their immune system built up? Right, right. Yeah, and I do want to mention too that that being outside is, I mean, that's the best place to be uh, to avoid infection because it's when we're inside in these sort of crowded, small, confined spaces, that's where germs uh, get around. That's where infections spread easily. So that's, that's just another reason why preschools in Sweden uh, and Scandinavia prefer to have the kids outside as much as possible because they actually get uh, less sick when they're outside more. Kids at these uh, forest schools, which sort of originated in Scandinavia and where, where kids spend most of the day outside, they have fewer sick days than the kids at traditional preschools. So they've kind of been able to show that it does help to be outside a lot. Even during times like these, I think it's, very, it's really important to remember that, that being outside and digging in the dirt, um, it's just good for kids. So yeah, in so, so many ways, physical, motor, so many ways, sensory. Yeah. And Definitely. so is every school in Sweden then considered a forest school? No, there, there are different types. Uh, forest schools, 
they're a separate niche where the better part of the day is spent outside. They do have like a school building, but you know, during the warmer months, they tend to eat outside and do everything outside. And, and they, they use the forests a lot. Uh, the more traditional preschools, they still have the kids outside a lot because they're actually mandated to by law here. It's in the curriculum for the preschool that the kids have to have outdoor playtime. They have less outdoor play time than the kids at Forest School. So there's a bit, a bit of a difference. But all I would say all preschools in Sweden actively involve nature in one way or form. Even in the big cities, the kids will walk to a park or, you know, do things like that so that they will get this sort of nature connection. But it's more of a neighbor, more of a neighborhood nature experience. Yeah, but I mean, nonetheless, they're getting them outdoors, which, yeah, like we said here, it's not every school that's doing that at all. So that's huge in itself. Other than saying there's no such thing as bad weather, are there any just like things you live by that help benefit you and your parenting and getting your own children outdoors? Yeah, like so obviously I try to model the behavior that I want you know, to see in my kids, like I try to always sort of be excited about going outside myself. I've made it part of our sort of family culture to go outside a lot. And uh, the kids sort of, they know that by now. How old are they now? They're nine and 12 now. So uh, my oldest daughter, she's really, she's a tween and uh, she's very much getting into video games, TikTok, staring at her phone, <laughs> a lot of screen time. We have a lot of screen time discussions <laughs> right now. So I'm sort of entering a new phase with this whole outdoor play thing. Like she, she's old enough now that She's starting to have more say in how she spends her free time and so forth. So we're sort of navigating this together, but I'm seeing some really encouraging signs that even though, yeah, she loves her video games and smartphones and whatnot, but I can tell that the things that I've been nagging about all these years, they have made an imprint because I can still tell that she she knows deep inside that she needs to go outside for just for her own well-being she recognizes that already at the age of 12 and i think this is what's so important that we sort of make this a habit early on just so that you know we build it because we're building a foundation for their the rest of their lives and we want them to continue to go outside as you know, they get into their teens and adolescents and, and as they become adults because, you know, it will keep benefiting them throughout life. So that's really what my end goal has been all along. That's what I want. I want them to have healthy habits. And I, I, I see it in the way that she will spontaneously go for walks in the woods by herself just because, because she knows that it's good for her and she enjoys it. So, you know, in between all that screen time, there's still, <laughs> there's still that. And, and I do try to make a point of doing things as a family, uh, the free lift sleeve way. <laughs> so to go canoeing and, and hiking and, and um, you know, things like that as a family. If, if there's one thing I would really encourage people to do, it's just to, to make it a habit. Even if you don't live nearby or a nice park or, or something like that, just get outside for, for as much or little time as you, can, uh, as you can spare. If it's 15 minutes a day, at least, you know, do it. And then once you're outside, um, hopefully you'll want to stay outside longer. I know the kids often do. And just take it from there. Start with baby steps and don't make it such a big deal with the, yeah, you, obviously the kids, uh, they need to be dressed properly. Like they need to have their basic needs taken care of or they're not going to enjoy their time out, you know, so you know, make sure they've eaten and that they're warm and they've been to the bathroom and, and then, you know, go outside and, and have a have a good time and, and make it a habit of it. Try to really prioritize it and, and make it a part of your, your day. Um, you don't have to plan activities to go with it. 
just um, just go outside and see what happens. Yeah, I love that you said that you don't have to plan activities. There's plenty for them to find and do on their own. They'll pick up a stick, they'll pick up rocks, and they'll make up their own game. Absolutely. Happens all the time. So if people wanted to get in touch with you, read your blog, where should they go? So my blog is at www.rainorshinemama.com. And that's mama with uh, two N's. Um, They can also find me on Facebook or Instagram, where I share some glimpses from our everyday life here in Sweden. Right, because you moved back there a few years ago, you said, right? I did. I did move back here a couple of years ago. We're, we're enjoying it. Yeah, after going back for six months, I, I realized it was, um, yeah, I, I wanted more. <laughs> so, so we ended up moving, moving back. So how long after you got back to the U.S. the first time did you decide you were going to go back more permanently? Um, I think I, I felt it sort of right away but it was a process and it 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 took some time uh to get everything organized it took a couple years but but now we're here awesome thank you this has been really really fun to hear your perspective and story and talk with you about all of this thank you for having me i enjoyed it free loose sleeve free loose sleeve (laughs) We're still working on our Scandinavian over here. Free loof sleeve. Free loof sleeve. So we're going to work on that before we pick up and move over to Sweden ourselves. We'll master the language first, and then we'll get over there. So this term that Sarah and I have been kind of struggling with and learning how to pronounce, it loosely translates to open air life. As Linda described in this episode, it's more of a lifestyle in a way where you continually immerse yourself in the outdoors in some way, shape, or form, which is like what we like to promote here at Hiking Through Life. There are benefits to getting outside. That can be you know, the typical outdoor recreation, or it can be in other ways that people may not think of as outdoors, but you're still out there. It's kind of like the outdoors is just part of your life. Like it's effortless in a way. You don't strive to necessarily make it a point to go out there and like, okay, well, I got to get all suited up and go out and now go do these activities or go for my walk or something like that but it just comes second nature and I think that's kind of the beauty of the term is that it's a life in a way like your life becomes just this thing that has the outdoors as part of it. Kind of makes me think of the fact that I've been hang drying our clothes outside ever since it's become really nice out. So something as simple as that, is acting on free loose leaf. I think this has a very strong meaning and connection for us. This free loose leaf. Free loose leaf term. So we might start adopting that. I am so grateful I got to talk to Linda. I've been following her for a little while and her book spoke to me so much. As a teacher, I'm just really drawn to outdoor recreation and how the outdoors can benefit children, and I'm always trying to dabble more into reading about that and talking to people about that because I'm so passionate about that. It's a part of me as a person, and it's a huge part of me in my professional life too. So that's why I reached out to her because her book spoke to me, her blog spoke to me. She has so many fantastic ideas, easy ideas about ways to get kids outside. To go outside with kids, you don't need all of this extra materials necessarily. You need your children and you. And there's no such thing as bad weather. And that's just so awesome because especially at our preschool that we work at, I'm so grateful for the fact that we do go outside 
pretty much no matter the weather unless it's below zero. Like we've had the kids out in basically an ice rink and they're chipping away at the ice. And I love that about the school that I work at. It's true, not all schools in the USA, not all preschools in the USA are like that. And I'm really proud and happy to be part of a school that does believe in that play and in outside time and the benefits it has on children and adults too. So if you're an adult listening to this, just remember. Get out and play. There's no such thing as bad weather. Go check out Linda's book, There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather, and her blog, Rain or Shine Mama, and maybe it'll inspire you to get out and play outdoors with your child. Or maybe it'll inspire you just to get outdoors yourself. We'll have links to all that in the description of this episode. Free loose leaf. Thanks for listening. We love sharing these stories with you through the Hiking Through Life podcast, and we're so grateful that you listen to this podcast. If you'd like to support the Hiking Through Life podcast further, we have these amazing new t-shirts and water bottles. The t-shirts come in four colors, and the water bottles are perfect for trails, adventuring, or daily use. Consider checking them out at hikingthroughlife.net slash shop. Use the code podcast and receive 10% off your first order. You've been listening to the Hiking Through Life podcast. Peace, love, and hike through life.